Another emergency, and hopefully another life saved. You're probably wondering why I'm standing outside of a hospital for a maths lesson. Well, in this series, we're looking at data handling. Hospitals, schools, government departments, city councils, and many organizations use statistics. So we've decided to look at some fascinating statistics that are used in the informed decision making of this hospital. Let's start here at the outpatients. This queue looks quite long. I wonder how many patients are seen here every day in this department. I wonder how many doctors are on duty. Let's find out. A hospital needs to know these kind of things. They also need to know how many bandages to order each month or when they should expect more patients than usual so they know when to let nurses go and leave. Let's see what we can find out. Hi. Hi, I'm from Mindset Learn. I'm looking for Matron Sebenza. Yes, I've been expecting you. Let's go to my office. So, how can I help you? We're looking at the use of data handling in our maths lesson. Data handling? I'm not sure what you mean. Data handling is an area of maths that uses statistics. Can you tell us about some of the ways that you use statistics in your job? Well, we keep records of how many patients we see on a daily basis here. Uh, that way, we can work out how many doctors are needed. When are your busiest times? We tend to call more doctors during the winter months, but also during December and Easter, we tend to be very, very busy. In casualty, our records show us that we need more staff in the early hours of the morning. Come in. Oh, hi, Loaz. You're just the right person to speak to. Loaz is involved in some clinical trials for a new flu medication. He uses a lot of statistics in his work. Hi, at the moment we have 20 women that have volunteered to do the clinical trials for the new vaccine. Now, in order for us to see whether it's effective and whether it has side effects, we need to monitor their blood pressures, their temperatures, and reactions to these medications on a daily basis. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Do you use graphs to represent your data in any way? Yeah, sure we do. For example, this graph compares the blood pressure changes of the volunteers. This helps us work out the standard deviation and the averages. What do you hope to find from this? If all 20 of the volunteers respond well to this new vaccine, we would like to work on a bigger sample and then maybe send these results to a pharmaceutical company that would like to produce these new vaccines. Well, I hope your research goes well. Thank you. In our series of six data handling lessons, we will look at the graphs that researchers like Loisy use. We want to study box and whisker plots, cumulative frequency graphs, and scatter plots. We also want to look at the different ways to measure an average of a set of data and how much the data is spread out. To do this, we will need the median, the interquartile range, as well as the mean and standard deviations. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to work out measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion, define a five-number summary, and draw a box and whisker plot. Maitron, do you perhaps have some data we could study? Maybe some records on patient numbers? Yes, um, the children's ward has asked me for more hospital beds. Um, they say that they currently have 20 and they need more than 80. So I asked them for all the records of all the hospital beds they used every month last year. Uh, if we can work out some kind of average with these numbers, I'm sure we can be able to convince the hospital management why we need those extra beds. Let's see what we have here. Let's start by looking at the records for just one month, the month of May. This is interesting. On the 7th of May, 
there were only two children in the ward. But here on the 29th, there were only 82 children in the ward. So in May, there were just over 80 children on one day. That doesn't seem like a good enough argument for 80 beds. Let's see what we can find out by looking at the different kinds of averages of this data. We'll start by looking at measures of central tendency. In other words, we measure how much the data tends towards the middle of the point. A measure of central tendency tells us what is happening in the middle of the data. We use three measures of central tendency. There are the mean, the median, and the mode. The mean is found by adding up your data and dividing by the number of pieces of data you have. Let's find the mean of these numbers of children. To do this, we add up all these numbers. I'll do it on a calculator. That's 15 plus 12 plus 11 plus 8 plus 5 plus 17. That's a total of 746. There are 31 days in May. So there are 31 numbers here. So I divide by 31. That's 24,06. Because I want to find an average number of people, I will round this off to 24. So the mean number of children in the ward each day is 24. I think we should compare this with the medium and the mode and see which average will help us the most. Let's look at the medium now. The medium is the middle number in the set of ordered data. So to find the medium, we need to put this data in order. Let's do that. There we are. Now we need to find the middle number. There are 31 numbers, so the middle number will be the 16th one. A quick way to find the medium is to take the number of pieces of data, which is 31. Add 1, divide by 2, so 31 plus 1 is 32. And half of that is 16. So the 16th number, it's this number here, 18. So the medium of this set of data is 18. We know what the mean and the medium are. Now let's see what the mode of this information is. The mode is the number that occurs most often in the set of data. There are four eighths, three sixteenths, three seventeenths, okay. The mode will be 8. What do these three averages show us and why are they so different? To understand this, we need to look at the data again. Do you see that there are three large numbers in the data? 62, 75 and 82. They are called outliers because they are not close to the other numbers and they lie outside of the expected range of the data. These three numbers will make the mean higher than we expect. In other words, the mean will be weighed towards these higher numbers. The medium is based on the positions of numbers. So, it is in the 16th number, no matter what the value of the number is. This means that the outliers don't make the medium a larger number than expected for this data. So, for the number of beds, the median of 18 is a better reflection of the average than the mean of 24. Perhaps it will help us to know why these outliers were such high numbers. Matron, were you surprised by the large numbers in those three days? Not really. I remember those three days. A primary school in our area had an outbreak um, of diarrhea, and a lot of the children had to be brought to hospital because they were dehydrated. How often does this happen? About twice a year, um, once in summer and once in winter. Well, let's see if we can make sense out of these different averages. What about the mode? The fact that there were eight children in the ward on four of those days doesn't help us. The ward definitely needs more than eight beds. But if we use the medium of 18, that means for the half of the 31 days, there will be enough beds. 
and quite often more than enough beds. But for these other days, 18 beds aren't enough. Now, let's look at the mean. That's 24. This might make sense, as there would be enough beds for the children every day, except on these days here. That means 10 out of the 31 days, there wouldn't be enough beds. If this happened every month, I don't think 24 beds are enough. That's the problem. Uh, sick children really do need to be hospitalized during treatment, which means beds. We need to find some other measure to strengthen our argument for more beds in the wards, because the ones that we currently have are not enough, and management won't give us as many as 80. Well, let's see if we can find another measure of data that could be useful to us. We can look at how the sample varies or is spread across the range of data. In other words, how it is dispersed. We call these measures of dispersion. The range, interquartile range, and semi-interquartile range are measures of dispersion. Let's start with the range. The range is the difference between the highest value and the lowest value. So the range of this data is 82 minus 2. That's a range of 80. That just tells us that there's a very big difference in the numbers of children from day to day. But there's a more useful measure of dispersion. Do you remember what the interquartile range is? Let me show you. Have a look at the data. We have already said that the value in the middle of the data is set in the median. The median splits the data into two halves. We can find the medium of each of these halves. This half has 15 numbers in it, so the eighth number will be its middle number. That's 12. This half has 28 as its middle value. These numbers, 12, 18, 28, divide the data into four quarters, which we call these quartiles. We call 12 the lower quartile and 28 the upper quartile. The range between the upper quartile and the lower quartile is called the interquartile range. 28 minus 12 is 16. So the interquartile range is 16. What this tells us is that the middle of the data stretches from 12 to 28. In other words, the middle half of the data, or the middle 50% of the data, spreads from 12 to 28 children in the ward. Another way of saying this is that three quarters of the time, or 75% of the time, up to 28 children are in the children's ward. I think we could use this information to argue that the children's ward needs at least 28 beds. There would still be seven days out of the month where they don't have enough beds. But that's better than what they have at the moment. Now people are often more convinced by an argument if you can represent the statistics to them in a visual way. The visual representation can make the statistics clearer and easier to understand. We've identified five important numbers from our set of data. We found the minimum values of 2 and the lower quartile of 12, the medium of 18, the upper quartile of 28, and the maximum value of 82. These five numbers give us information about the whole set of data. We call these numbers the five number summary. One way to represent our five number summary effectively is to draw a box and a whisker plot. The first step is to draw a horizontal axis to cover the range of values. In this case, we need to cover values from 2 to 82. It will make sense to start from 0 and go up to 85. We'll need to decide on a scale that works so that 85 can fit across the page. It is best to use the whole space available so that your graph is as big and as clear as possible. We could use a centimeter for every five units. Then we would need 17 centimeters across the page. Now we make a mark at each point of the five number summary. So we put in a line to mark off 2, 12, 18, 28, and 82. Then we join these markers to make a box with a whisker on each side of it. The box is drawn from the lower quartile at 12 up to the upper quartile at 28. We join it at the top and at the bottom. The box now represents the interquartile range of our data. It draws our attention to the middle of the data. Then we draw a line from the box to the minimum of 2 here, 
and another line from the box to the maximum of 82 here. These are the whiskers and they link the box to the end points. However, I need to explain that some people prefer to put a limit to the length of the whiskers. They state that the whiskers cannot be longer than one and a half times the interquartal range or the length of the box. So when you draw a box and a whisker plot, you need to check the length of the whiskers. In this plot, the length of the box is 12 to 28. So that's 16. One and a half times 16 is 24. The whisker on the right looks like it is longer than 24. Let's check from 28 to 82. Yes, that is much longer than 24. 28 plus 24 is 52. So the whisker cannot go past 52. The last point of our data before 52 was 37. So the whisker goes to 37 and these three values, which were outliers, are plotted as separate points here at 62, 75 and 82. So there are two accepted ways to plot a box and a whisker plot. You can extend the whiskers to the minimum and maximum values, or you can limit them as we have done here and plot the outliers as separate points. Now look at our box and whisker plot. What do you notice about the size and the position of the box and the lengths of the whiskers? Did you see that the diagram looks skew? The box is bigger on the right side of the median than the one on the left side. We say that the box and the whisker plot is skewed right. This means that the data is spread out more to the right of the median than the left. When data is skewed in this way, we say that it is positively skewed. What do you think this tells us about the data? In other words, how does it help us to interpret the data? And how would we use this diagram to motivate giving the children's ward more beds? Well, the diagram shows us for 50% of the time, there are between 12 to 28 children in the ward. Does this help us? Maybe if I say this differently, you will see that it is useful. We can say that up to three quarters of the time, there are up to 28 children in a ward. However, there is one aspect of this discussion that has not been addressed yet. We drew all these conclusions based on the data from only one month of the year. We did this so it was easier to explain all the data handling concepts and methods we've used. But we don't know if this is a fair reflection of what is needed throughout the year. I have looked at the data for the rest of the year. I worked out the five number summary from the data for the whole year. When I plotted this box and the whisker plot, this is what I found. It is still positively skewed with a much longer whisker on the right but the medium is about in the middle of the box that shows the interquartal range. The whole box is shifted over the right. From this diagram, I can see that 75% of the year, up to 39 children were attended to in the children's ward of this hospital per day. So the year statistics suggest that the hospital needs at least 39 beds in the children's ward if they want to have enough beds for 75% of the year. I like this plan. On the other days when we don't have enough beds, we can make a plan of putting mattresses on the floor for the kids who are not too sick. In this lesson, we saw that the interquartal range can be used to give us useful measures. We use the five number summary to plot the box and the whisker plot. We also saw that data can be positively skewed. Now it's time for your task. The coffee shop in the hospital needs to know how many bread rolls to order each day so they don't run out or have too many unsold at the end of the day. The data shows the number of bread rolls sold per day in two weeks. Find the mean, the median and the upper and lower quartiles. Then calculate the range and the interquartile range. Use these measures to recommend what number of bread rolls should be ordered daily. Join us next time when we will use more statistics from the hospital. I'm <laughs> sorry.